Hey guys, my name is Shreyas and welcome to Simple Biology. In this video we're going to be talking about phylogenetic trees. Phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species or group of species. Okay, so basically that would mean what are all the ancestors of a species and how those ancestors evolved to what that species is today. Systematics is a study which focuses on classifying these organisms and determining their evolutionary relationships. So scientists use the phylogeny of organisms as well as systematics to construct a tree of life. And this tree of life basically um, shows the common ancestor and everything coming out of that in this like evolutionary tree. Now taxonomy is a scientific study of how organisms are named and classified. It's important to classify organisms in order to be able to you know, kind of just keep like a collection of all the organisms, I mean, sorry, all the species that we know today. When we, the first thing about taxonomy is binomial nomenclature. We kind of talked about this, but let's go ahead and talk about it again. Uh, this is created by the scientist uh, Carlos Linnaeus. And it, he used these, and it's still used today, so species are not mixed up with each other. Let me give an example. Okay, you might be asking, why do we use binomial nomenclature to name species instead of just, you know, using common names? Think about the elephant, okay? So you probably know what an elephant is. However, there's different types of elephants. There's actually an African elephant and then there's an Indian elephant, and they're very different from each other. So because of that, scientists have this way of naming species and, species and classifying them so that these species are not mixed up. Um, so when we talk about binomial nomenclature, the first, there's um, two names within, two parts within the name. The first part of the binomial is the genus, and the second part of the binomial is the species. For example, our binomial nomenclature for human beings is Homo sapiens. Okay, this would be the genus, and this would be the species. Now, realize that first it's always italicized, so whenever you're talking about binomials, they don't have to be italicized. Uh, and also notice that the first letter of um, the first letter of the uh, genus is capitalized, and the first letter of the species is not capitalized. That goes with any binomial uh, name. Now, also in taxonomy is important to know is a hierarchical classification, which basically is a system scientists use to classify organisms. So basically there's one, these little names are all kind of like uh, units and with each um, you break into different, more and more specific um, things. So you start with the domain and then the kingdom, the phylum, the class, the order, the family, the genus, and the species. So the domain is the most wide unit and then the species is, prob is obviously the most uh, specific. So as you go down, you get more and more specific. Domain, there's three domains, bacteria, eukarya, and archaea. And within each domains, these domains are kingdoms. Within each of the, those kingdoms are phylums, class, ordered families, genuses, and species. An easy way to remember this classification is uh, this phrase right here. King Philip came over for great soup. As you can, sorry, I keep doing that. As you can see, the uh, first letter of um, each of these words matches with the order here. Now, a taxon is a unit at any level in the hierarchy. For example, if you look to your homo, Homo is an example of a taxon with a genus. Uh, sapiens is an example of another taxon within uh, uh, species. Okay, pretty simple. Now, phylogenetic trees show the evolutionary um, history of an organism. Now, it's important to know that Linnaean classification does not necessarily match evolutionary history. So, if you look at, let's say, a lot um, some organisms within a genus, that does not uh, mean that they are necessarily necessarily related to each other through evolution. Sometimes they might be just classified together because of their um, similarities in how they appear. So because of that, scientists um, can't depend on Linnaean classification, this classification right here, in order to just you know just just um, see the relationships between organisms. So some scientists have proposed a new way of um, classifying organisms um, through a system called phylocode, but this is not very um, common. Scientists still use Linnaean classification for the most part, and in addition to that, have these phylogenetic trees. So what is a phylogenetic tree? So this is an example of a phylogenetic tree. Um, so if you look here, you start with 
um, one species and then they can break apart into more and more species. Okay, each of these little points right here, these are called branch points, that would be a branch point, that would be a branch point, and that would be a branch point. That represents a common ancestor. So the common ancestor of this taxon A, taxon B, and taxon C is this common ancestor, is this right here. The common ancestor of taxon B and taxon C is this common ancestor found at this branch point right here. The common ancestor of all these taxons is the one found right here, okay? A polytomy is an unresolved pattern of divergence. So in a polytomy, you have kind of like a branch point, except you see more than two organisms coming out. So this means that whenever you have something like this, it means that scientists have not figured out what exactly is going on here, so they've just put um, them all together, okay? When you have three organisms, um, three three taxons coming out like this, it means that there is. It does not mean that there's a common ancestor right here. It just means that there's an unresolved pattern of divergence. The final thing you have to know about um, phylogenetic trees is sister taxa are two taxa which are related through um, a direct common ancestor. So, because these two have a direct common ancestor right here, they are sister taxa. Okay. Okay, here we have another um, phylogenetic tree, which is a little different. It's shaped a little differently, but, you know, it's it's, um, it's still a phylogenetic tree. Um, in this phylogenetic tree, uh, obviously, I don't have organisms here. I have methods of transportation, um, but it's uh, just so you can understand. So here, you start with the horse, and then, again, at either, each of these branch points is a common answer. So there's a common ancestor here and here. And here and here. But the interesting about this phylogenetic tree is that you can see um, characteristics. So a horse does not have anything. Um, then what differentiates a horse from a bicycle are wheels. Uh, what differentiates a bicycle from a car is an engine and what differentiates a car from an airplane are wings. Now if you notice here, wheels are found in bicycles, cars, and airplanes. Now uh, here engines are found in cars and airplanes. And um, wings are just found in airplanes. So if you have a trait here, that means everything above it is also going to have that trait. So that's a pretty cool way of um, also drawing phylogenetic trees. Now the limitations of phylogenetic trees is, one, they cannot be used as a measure of time. So here, you can't just assume that this common ancestor was formed at the same time of this, as this common ancestor just because they're you know, aligned this way. So you can't make any assumptions like that. You can just assume um, the evolutionary history, but you can't assume the time at which each event happened. The second thing is that you cannot assume that one organism evolved from another within a sister taxa. So let's say in the sister taxa right here, you can't assume that taxon C evolved from taxon B, and you can't um, assume that taxon B evolved from taxon C, same way, vice versa. You can, only, you can only assume that taxon B and taxon C have a direct common ancestor. That's it. Now, how do scientists create phylogenetic trees? Well, they need data. So the data they use are either morphological or molecular homologies. Morphological, morphological, we talked about um, homologies. You might want to go and check that out for, in previous videos. Morphological homologies uh, describe um, things, homologies which have to do with like body parts and structure. Molecular homologies describe uh, homologies which have to do with you know, DNA. So. They use these in order to create phylogenetic trees. Sometimes scientists run into this issue, and that's when you have to distinguish a homology from an analogy. So that's homology, just as a review, is from uh, structure uh, parts which are structured together um, because of direct ancestry, and analogy is because um, pro um, stru structures which are similar because of convergent evolution. Um, so homoplasties is another term for analogous structures. Um, this all this might be confusing, you know. So please go back to previous videos and learn what all these terms mean. Okay. For example, so wait, sorry. So whenever you have a homology, might be an analogy. What scientists do is uh, they look for two things. They look for similarity with the complex structures. Example um, would be a monkey and human skulls. Monkey and human skulls um, fuse together in almost exactly the same way. So whenever you have um, the similarities in complex structures you can usually assume that it is um, indeed a homology instead of an, an um, analogy and that it is part of evolutionary history. Um, also similarity in genetic information, if the two organisms share a lot of genetic information which are extremely similar, you can also um, assume that it's a homology and not an analogy. 
Now, molecular systematics is a study which uses DNA and other molecular data to determine evolutionary relationships. It's an important term to know. Finally, cladistics uh, is systematics which focus on organizing species based on their shared characteristics. Okay, so it's a type of systematics, and they create phylogenetic trees, except that they're focusing on shared characteristics. Okay, that's their main focus. Uh, a clade is um, just, they create phylogenetic trees. Cladistics create phylogenetic trees just like um, any um, other um, type of systematics. However, uh, they have, um, a clade is a common ancestor with all its descendants. So let's say that this phylogenetic tree was created by, um, created, sorry, by, by uh, cladistics, then you could assume that this is a clade. So, for example, taxon B, taxon C, and the common ancestor, that's a clade, because a clade is a common ancestor and all its descendants. So here, common ancestor and all its descendants. Um, obviously, there are smaller clades and there's bigger clades. Um, the, a bigger clade would be this common ancestor and then all its descendants um, over here, you know? So the whole thing could also be considered a clade. Now, whenever you're doing cladistics, there's two important terms to know. The first term is a shared ancestor character. So that's a character which is common to all species in a clade as well as the ancestor. So for example, with mammals, you know, all mammals have uh, defined vertebrae, you know, backbones. All mammals do, as well as the common ancestor that mammals came from. That common ancestor also had um, a backbone. Therefore, that's a shared ancestral character. A shared derived character is a character that is not found in the ancestor. For example, hair. Uh, mammals have hair, but the common ancestor of mammals did not have hair. So that's a shared derived character because it was derived with time the ancestor did not have it. That's it for phylogenetic trees. Stay in tuned. We're going to be talking about other great things with evolution in future videos. But for now, Phylogenetic trees is as simple as that.